seventh grade science at Highlands Middle School in White Plains, New York. My name is Brian Sullivan, and I am a proud seventh grade science teacher and member of the New York State United Teachers. <laughs> I'm joined today by my wife, Amy, my four children, Brendan, Eleanor, Shay, and Layla, my mother and father, Nancy and Tom. Over 20 years ago, I came home to this community in Valhalla, where I was welcomed by former teachers and coaches and began working with young athletes. There, I discovered my passion for engaging with children. I enrolled here at Westchester Community College to begin accruing the credits necessary to become a science teacher. I could not have chosen a more fulfilling career, the entirety of which I have spent in the wonderfully diverse community of White Plains. In White Plains, the children have always been my why. They are why I love my work, and I am inspired by them daily. I am humbled to be here representing the thousands of educators who provide knowledge, joy, comfort, safety, and stability to so many children. That's why I'm concerned about harmful cuts in the recent House bill, cuts that would result in teachers losing their jobs and more students in every classroom. These cuts would make it harder for me and my colleagues to educate our students. Forcing these harmful cuts through the threat of default won't help us train our future leaders. Luckily, we have a president who is fighting for us, for teachers, for students. He knows our students are the future of our country. And being married to a fellow educator, he knows that better than most. It is my privilege to introduce to you our President of the United States of America, Joe Biden. Looks like he spends a lot of time in the gym. Please sit down, sit down, sit down. <clears throat> it's good to be back. It's good to be back. <laughs> Governor Hochul, thank you for uh, welcoming us to your state. And she's helping New York lead the way in making things in America. And I mean making things in America, not importing them, making them, Send, sending products out, bringing jobs back. And my friend, the Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, can't be here today. I don't know what he's doing. He's just down there and trying to settle a crisis. And he's the best there is, man. And I want to thank him for working so hard for the people of the state and for being such a great partner. Nobody's been a greater fight for women's rights in the Congress than Senator Kristen Gillibrand. God love her. I've been backing everything she's wanted to do for a long time. I tell you what, when she comes in and asks her for something, it's easy to just say yes. Don't even start discussing it, because you're just going to give in anyway. She's taken on the military, and she's made — she's a game-changer. And uh, it's great to see Representative Jamal Bowman, lifelong educator, <laughs> champion of the next generation. And Republican Congress Mike Lawler is here as well. Mike's on the other team, but you know what? Mike is the kind of guy that when uh, — when I was in the Congress, they were the kind of Republican I was used to dealing with. But uh, he's not one of these MAGA Republicans, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. I don't want to get him in trouble by saying anything nice about him <laughs> or negative about him. But I, thanks for coming, Mike. Thanks for being here. This is the way we used to do it all the time. And I want to acknowledge all the state and local officials as well. The President 
Belinda Miles, thanks for hosting us. And uh, my <laughs> Madam President, my wife teaches full time at a community college in Northern Virginia, and she's been teaching for a long time. She says two things. One, the community college is the best kept secret in America. Well, they are. And two, equally as important, any educate any any state that out educates us, any country that out educates us, is going to out compete us. It's a simple proposition. This is a really important moment. There's a big debate going on in this country about protecting America's hard-earned reputation as the most trusted, reliable nation in the world, and about how how we fix the long-term fiscal health of this nation. The debate is with enormous implications for the American economy, and quite frankly, for the world economy. And that's not hyperbole for the world economy. It's important for the American people to know what's at stake. This isn't just a theoretical debate going on in Washington. The decisions we make are going to have real impact on real people's lives. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So let me tell you a story about what's going on. There's a very extreme wing of the Republican Party, and the House of Representatives referred to themselves now. I've been calling them this for a while, but now they refer to themselves as the MAGA Republicans. And they've taken control of the House. They've taken control. They have a speaker who has his job because he yielded to the, quote, MAGA element of the party. And they're doing the best, to the best of my knowledge, what no other political party has done in the nation's history. They're literally, not figuratively, holding the economy hostage by threatening to default on our nation's debt that if we've already, debt we've already incurred, we've already incurred over the last couple hundred years unless we give in to their threats and demands as to what they think we should be doing with regard to the budget. This would be incredibly damaging. Here's what the Speaker has put forward for the Republican proposal. He says he's going to take the funding, that we, how we fund government, back to what the levels were in 2022, before the omnibus bill. And they exclude any cuts in defense. He said we're going to go back to spending what we spent in 2022. But we're not going to make any cuts in defense, which we spent in 2023. We're calling for in 2023. You may remember, in the State of the Union, I got our Republican colleagues to agree somewhat spontaneously <laughs> 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 to, uh, to protect Social Security and Medicare from any cuts. Remember I said, now let me get this straight. You're not going to cut Medicare? You're not going to cut? So they say, that's right. I said, well, you know, you're on, you're on camera. They can see you. <laughs> well, so far, they're not cutting Social Security so far. And not only do they rule out any new revenue, they're still determined to make permanent the $2 trillion tax cuts, which due to expire, the Trump tax cuts, without paying a penny of it. Now, here, look, here's what that leaves us with. It's this basic sort of math. It leaves us with the requirement to cut 22 percent of everything else in the budget in order to meet the requirements they're demanding that we live at the 2022 budget numbers. The Speaker and the Republicans don't like that I point that out. But that's not my opinion. It's just basic math. And here's what it does. It makes huge cuts in important programs for millions of working and middle-class Americans programs they count on. According to estimates, the Republican bill would put 21 million people at risk of losing Medicaid, including 2.3 million people here in New York State and 78,000 people right here in Westchester County. It's devastating. It's not right. The Republican plan would cut federal law enforcement officers, 30,000, including 11,000 FBI agents, 2,000 border agents, DEA agents, and so on. They've cut. That's what it's in order to meet the requirements. They'd have to cut that many law enforcement officers. It risks shutting down 375 air traffic control towers, including five right here in New York State, like Westchester County Airport, because we don't have enough personnel. And I've long believed that we have many obligations as a nation, but the only — I've heard me say this before. I apologize for repeating it. But — we only have one truly sacred obligation. We have many obligations, one sacred obligation. And that's to equip those we send to war and take care of them and their families when they come home. That's a sacred obligation. For real. 
And that's why one of the reasons I fought so hard and I was so proud to sign the Bipartisan PACT Act that takes care of millions of veterans who are exposed to toxic materials that take care of their families as well. My son went to Iraq for a year, was one of the healthiest guys in his outfit, came back with stage four glioblastoma, having lived just a couple, less than a quarter mile from one of those major burn pits. You saw what happened in the trade towers that went down, what happened to all those firemen and exposure to toxic chemicals. But under the Republican bill today, they would cut 30 million veterans' health care visits. The way they do that, that's including nearly 2 million health care visits for veterans in New York State because there's not enough personnel. There's not enough personnel. The difference between the 2022 budget, which they want to get back to, and the 2023 budget is I increased the funding for the Veterans Administration by $22 billion. And the reason I did it And the reason I did it, and probably some of you know of these folks, the number of, you know, more veterans are committing suicide than are being killed in battle. And so they pick up the phone and they call the VA in their area. I need help. We'll come in in six weeks. Come in and whatever. Well, we ended that. We ended that. Now they want to go back to the levels where we cut those folks that now provide that kind of help. This amounts to a $22 billion cut in veterans' health care. Now, they dispute this. They uh, — nowhere in their actual proposal are their exclusive protection for veterans. But they say I'm — uh, it's unusual language we use with presidents these days. They say I'm lying when I say that. Well, the truth is, why do so many veterans' groups — why have they spoken out in opposition to the Republican proposal? They're not all Democrats. They know what's going to happen. Folks, that's a game Republicans are playing. Anytime you single out the impact of their overall cuts, they tell you, no, 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 it's not true. But they're wrong. They want to protect something. They would have written it down and say, we're protecting it. You can't cut this program. You can't cut it. So you can see it. Here's another example. Under the Republican plan, nationwide, 100,000 teachers and support staff would lose their jobs at the very time we're attempting to overcome the sufficient, the incredible deficiencies that occurred as a consequence of what happened with the pandemic. So many kids, the average student out there is about a year and a half behind. We don't need fewer teachers, we need more teachers. And by the way, no, I'm. Uh, I'm not being solicitous. What we should be doing, and I'm proposing when I try to finish this job, and proposing that we, for example, if we start, instead of Head Start, which they want to cut 21,000 Head Start spots in this, this state alone, we should be sending, all the studies show that if we sent, no matter what the background of a child, if we sent that child to a school at age three, learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, age three and four and five, we end up increasing by 56 percent the chance they'll graduate from high school and go on beyond high school. But look, we're here at a community college. And by the way, this is one beautiful community college. What a — no, it, it really is. The property here is made. And the consequences here would be severe. Here in New York, it would cut the maximum Pell Grant that millions of students use to get to community college by nearly $1,000. It would eliminate Pell Grants entirely for 5,000 New York students. And here had another devastating consequence they don't want you to know about. Moody's, not a Democratic outfit, a respected Wall Street analytical firm said the Republican plan would cost the country 780,000 jobs. Yesterday, I brought the congressional leaders together at the White House to make sure America doesn't default on its debt and for the first time in our history. And by the way, I know the speaker keeps saying, uh, 93 days ago, I said to Biden, I want to talk to him. And I said, fine. I said, you put down your budget, I'll put down mine. I laid mine down in detail on the, four, on the 9th of, uh, of uh, March. He didn't put down his 
so-called budget, I don't know what, it, what, it, what you'd call it, his connecting the two items. He didn't do that until five days after he did it, I invited him to the White House. So folks, look, let's be clear. The debt we're talking about has accumulated over 200 years. The last administration alone, the last guy who served in this office for four years, increased the total national debt by 40% in just four years. Over the last decade, the single largest contribution to the debt, aside from the pandemic, were the Trump tax cuts skewed to the wealthy and large corporations for $2 trillion. It made it clear, I made it clear, America is not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills. And I was pleased, but not surprised, by the Republican leader in the United States Senate, McConnell, who said after the meeting in the White House and he went to the press, he said, the United States is not going to default. It never has and it never will. We shouldn't even be talking about it. And folks, Republicans in Congress used to understand this. In fact, under the previous president, Republicans voted to avoid default three times. This is not your father's Republican Party, though. You know, here's what's happened if MAGA Republicans get their way. American defaults on our debt, higher interest rates for credit cards, car loans, mortgages, payments for Social Security, Medicare, our troops, veterans could all be halted or delayed. According again to Moody's, 8 million Americans would lose their jobs, including 400,000 New Yorkers alone. Our economy would fall into recession, and our international reputation would be damaged in the extreme. We shouldn't even be having this situation. We're talking about this situation. As you know, I do an awful lot of foreign policy with my, my stint as a senator for all those years and then as vice president. And I've traveled the world. I've met with over 80 heads of 88 heads of state so far. They all are looking at me. Are you guys serious? No, no, I'm serious. Because if we default on our debt, the whole world is in trouble. This is a manufactured crisis. There's no question about America's ability to pay its bills. America is the strongest economy in the world, and we should be cutting spending and lowering the deficit without a needless crisis in a responsible way. I believe in cutting spending and cutting the deficit. In my first two years in office, I'm the only president in history that's lowered the deficit in those two years by a record $1.7 trillion. $1.7 trillion. And the budget I proposed back in March would cut the deficit again by nearly $3 trillion in the decade ahead. For example, my budget cuts $30 billion in wasteful spending on tax subsidies to the gas and oil companies. They earned two, but here, tax subsidies aren't all bad, but they earned $200 billion last year. Do they need a $30 billion subsidy? Well, look, it cuts wasteful spending for big pharma. We pay more for our prescription drugs than any nation in the world, any advanced nation in the world. You can get the exact same drug if you fly to Paris or London or to Germany, anywhere you've traveled, Canada, and you, that you, then you pay here, you pay a lot more. On big pharma, we cut that spend by $200 billion by expanding the Medicare's power to negotiate prescription drug prices and making drug companies pay rebates when they raise prices faster than inflation. And we've already cut by $160 billion in savings, the bill we passed last year, and it has three parts to it, by the way. One, didn't, one part didn't kick until January 1. We said the price of insulin and other drug, the, the price of insulin would be reduced to $35 how, let me put this How many of you know someone with type one or two, type one or type two diabetes? And you know, you know, it's needed to keep. Uh, they need insulin to keep themselves alive or their children alive, or in good health. Well, guess what? The price of insulin went from four, five, six hundred bucks a month down to thirty-five dollars a month. for those on Medicare. And let, here's the deal. It's not just that it made it reasonable for people to be able to stay healthy, but it saved the government $160 billion because they're paying less out. And by the way, the other cuts that are coming up, 
uh, because of what we did in Medi with, with regard to being able to negotiate with Medicare. It's estimated we're going to save another $200 billion. For example, any of you know someone who's on Medicare and also on a cancer drug? Well, guess what? They're paying right now sometimes twelve, fourteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 a year for the cancer drug. Well, beginning this next January, the most any senior is going to have to pay is $3,500 for all of their drugs. And beginning in 2025, in 2025, they've paid no more than $2,000 for all their drugs. Well, by the way, that saves the government another $200 billion because you're not paying out for all the drugs come forward and they come at a reasonable price. My budget also cuts tax loopholes. Look, I, I don't have anything against Wall Street or hedge funds executive, but just pay your taxes, man. No, I'm serious. Hedge funds executive pay a lower tax rate than the middle class worker who works for them. No one earning less than $400,000 is going to see a single penny in increase in their taxes under me. Not a single penny. They haven't yet, and they won't. If you're making, if you're making more than four hundred, dollars well, start to pay your fair share. Look, instead, we're making the biggest corporation begin to pay their fair share. Just, not, I, I'm not talking about 70% tax rates. For example, at least pay something. Folks, let me ask you this. Does anyone think we have a fair tax system in America? No, no I'm, I'm being deadly earnest. I'm not being a wise guy. <clears throat> in 2020, you got tired of hearing me say this. I pointed out there were 50 major corporations of the 55 of the Fortune 500 companies that paid zero in federal income tax after having made $40 billion in profits. $40 billion. So we instituted and got passed a corporate minimum tax of 15%. Well, guess what? You all are paying more than that. Just 15%. And it paid for everything we did. Look, I proposed a billionaire minimum tax. There are now went, about, went from about 760, I think the number was, to around 1,000 billionaires in America. Well, that's great. If you want to be a billionaire, you can make it. I'm, I'm not one of these guys that say you shouldn't be able to do that. And if you want to be, if you're a multimillionaire, I'm not trying to say that can't happen, but at least pay something. The average tax paid by the thousand billionaires in America individually, the average tax paid is eight percent. E I G H T, eight percent. No billionaire should be paying a lower tax rate than a school teacher or a firefighter. There's nothing radical about this. That's why my budget also fully funds the Internal Revenue Service. You know, it's kind of interesting. Republicans have been consistent for the last 10 years, cutting the number of IRS agents. I wonder why. <laughs> so we now have legislation that passed that's, gonna, that's in our budget that says we're going to beef up the number of IRS agents to thoroughly look at the taxes of billionaires in America. According to the Congressional Budget Office, a bipartisan office, they estimate that just that alone would raise another $200 billion a year. Larry Summers, who's not what you call a wacko liberal out there, right? Former president of Harvard, he says it's more like... F <laughs> My kids who went to Penn would disagree, but that's okay. <laughs> But I went to a great school. I went to a state school. I went to the University of Delaware. But anyway, but, but, all, but, all, but, but all kidding aside, estimates that it would raise another $400 billion a year. A year. And they still wouldn't be paying very much tax relative to their income to begin with. My budget also has some of the strongest anti-fraud proposals ever. You may remember when we had that, the legislation to help deal with the pandemic, what, what Trump used to keep doing is cutting the number of inspectors general to be able to find out whether or not this money is actually not being wasted. Well, guess what? Turns out there was about there were several billions of dollars that were being wasted. People were getting money they didn't need or didn't deserve, and, this, and they, were, they were playing the system. 
Well, you know, I think it, that we should have inspectors general again, looking at what, in fact, we're spending and whether it's going where it's supposed to go. It calls for an unprecedented effort to combat identity fraud for, by tripling anti-fraud strike forces to prosecute pandemic fraudsters and seize back stolen funds. There's billions of dollars in stolen funds that we haven't gotten back yet. It strengthens the inspector generals and watchdogs for taxpayers' dollars. It's estimated for every $10, every $1 we spend in hiring these folks, it's going to save $10. $10. This debate is about fundamental choices. Would you rather cut, would you rather continue a subsidy of $30 billion for big oil or cut $30 billion from veterans? Would you rather cut big pharma or, and, or cut health care for Americans? These are real world choices. That's what's at stake, literally. You know, I ran for president to see to it that ordinary folks got an even shake. I was raised in a family that was a typical, we weren't poor. Typical middle-class family. My dad, we lived in a three-bedroom split-level home in a housing development that got, it was a nice area. That was when they were developing suburbia with four kids and a grandpa living with us. I, I look back on it and wonder how thin those walls were for my mom and dad, but at any rate. <laughs> but, you know, the truth of the matter is that, uh, um, you know, we, my, my dad did fine. I guess by the time... He retired. He managed an automobile dealership. He was probably making the equivalent of $20,000 a year, which would be like, what, 60 or 70 or 80? I don't know what it would be. But my point is that I thought, I've always thought the middle class folks are getting the short end of things. I think the trickle down economy, not much ever trickled down on my dad's table that I can recall. And so when I ran in my whole career as a senator, it was about making sure middle class folks get an even shot. That's why I believe we should grow the economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. The wealthy will still do very well. <laughs> because when the middle class does well, the poor have a ladder up and the wealthy still do very well. And that's fine. We all do well. We've made enormous progress. Just look at what we've done so far. Over the past two years, we've created a record 12.7 million new jobs more than ever in that period of time, including 800,000 manufacturing jobs. Unemployment is at 3.4%, the lowest in 50 years. Black unemployment is at one of its lowest levels. Hispanic unemployment across the board. In part, our policies are, and the pace of our annual inflation has been coming down for 10 months in a row. We still slowed by 45%. We still have more to do. But, you know, when we're in a position to invest in America, in all of America, the way we do that is we buy American products, we hire American workers. I get to spend a lot of money that Congress passes. So if I have $60 billion to spend, I, and I'm going to have to put new decks on aircraft carriers, I don't outsource the work. There was a law back in the 30s that said, buy American, buy American. So we, they have to use American products. They have to go out and make sure that they hire American workers. For a long time, in Democrat and Republican administrations, it was cheaper to go get the cheap labor overseas and bring back the expensive product. No more. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. <laughs> Instead of importing jobs abroad for cheaper labor and importing product, we're exporting product and buying American workers the opportunity to make a living. Folks, I signed the American Rescue Plan, which sent $27 million to this community college to keep students enrolled <laughs> and keep this school afloat, help vaccinate our nation, got immediate relief for folks who needed it the most, and got our economy back in track. It didn't have a single solitary Republican vote. Then I signed the bipartisan infrastructure law, which had some Republicans voting for it, to build the roads, the best roads, bridges, airports, water system, high-speed internet. Get rid of all those, those pipes that are polluting water, et cetera. You know, how can we be the most prosperous economy in the world without having the greatest infrastructure in the world? We used to be ranked number one in the world in infrastructure. You know what we rank now? 13. 13. Next week, this infra is infrastructure week. Remember all for four years in the last guy, we had infrastructure week every week? Well, under my predecessor, infrastructure week became a punchline. 
on my watch for making infrastructure a decade, a headline. We've already announced over 25,000 projects in 4,500 towns across from our cross Westchester County is projects for better water, wastewater and sewer systems, repairing dams and doing so much more. I signed the Chips and Science Act, which I felt very strongly about. <laughs> to bring back key parts of our supply chain back to America. Remember when we had real trouble when automobiles, they, Detroit said they had to stop making automobiles? You know, they take 30,000 chips, I mean 3,000 chips. Well, guess what? They were all being made in Asia. And when the pandemic hit, they shut down. So we were in trouble. Folks, these are the small computer chips the size of the end of your little finger. Nearly everything in our lives, from cell phones, automobiles, refrigerators, most sophisticated weapon systems. America invented these chips. We invented them. We made them better. But over time, we went from producing up to 40% of the world's chips to producing only 10%, despite leading the world in research and design. Now we're turning that around. The private sector, I went around the world and at home and I convinced people that they had to invest in building the chip factories here. They call them FABs, F-A-B-S, factories. Investing, guess what? We've got a commitment for investments of $470 billion in American, by American companies home and abroad for manufacturing clean energy like Micron and Syracuse investing $100 billion over the next 20 years to build semiconductors thanks to the hard work of Chuck Schumer and Governor Hochul. IBM and Poughkeepsie investing $20 billion over the next uh, computer chip. Putting America back in the game and creating thousands of good paying jobs. Many of these jobs, in the, first of all, the construction takes a lot, a lot of jobs. They don't require four years' degrees when you're in these fabs. You know what the average pay is going to be? Close to $100,000. You don't need a college degree. That's progress. But I know folks are still struggling with inflation. The way I think about it is the way my dad used to talk about it around the kitchen table for real. He'd say, how much are the monthly bills? At the end of the month, you have enough to pay for all your bills and just have a little breathing room left, just a little breathing room. Well, that's why I wrote and signed the Inflation Reduction Act. Americans pay more in prescription drugs, I said, than any advanced country on Earth. We're fighting for years to allow Medicare to negotiate those lower drug prices. Well, we finally beat Big Pharma, and we did it without a single Republican vote. I'll have a, it'll have a profound impact and save lives. It's already happening. As I mentioned earlier, it's going to reduce the deficit by $160 billion just this year. And how many of, you know, you know like I, I said, diabetes, one in 10 Americans have diabetes. Millions need insulin to stay alive. Insulin has been around for 100 years. Cost 10 bucks to make it, $10. Package it, a total of $12. And they're paying hundreds of dollars, making record profits. Well, we capped it at 35 bucks, as I said. And we're going to make sure, we're going to make sure it's capped at 35 for everyone, not just those on Social Security. Because guess what? It saves the taxpayer money. The federal government doesn't have to write a check for 400 bucks. It writes a check for 35 bucks. Look, Inflation Reduction Act also makes the biggest investment in fighting climate change anywhere in the history of the world. And it's creating tens of thousands of jobs as a giant step towards saving the planet. Tax credit for consumers to weatherize their homes. Many of you have done it. Purchasing energy-efficient windows, doors, appliances, electric vehicles can save an average of 1000 bucks a year. Look, tax credits for states and businesses to deploy renewable energy, solar, wind, hydrogen, and more. Not a single Republican voted for it, this law. And now they want to get, away with, get rid of it all. Why would they want to repeal a law that's creating American jobs and lowering costs for American families? Well, when we have, when we ever heard of a Republican opposing tax credits for businesses? Well, that's what they're doing this time. Take a look at the New York Times yesterday, what they wrote. I think it was a front page. Texas now is becoming one of the leading states in the nation in renewable energy. The number of wind farms they have, solar farms, and hydrogen. But now the Republicans want to get rid of this law and these tax credits. Well, why do you think that is? 
because the fossil fuel industry wants to get rid of them. That's why. Even though they're creating jobs, for, 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 uh, taking on climate change, they don't want it because it's so, so much more costly to go the other route. They say it costs too much, but the truth is it's too successful. And here's the real truth. Big oil doesn't want it, and Republicans are carrying their water. That's what this is all about. Let me close with this. We made so much progress, but there's so much more to do. We're on the cusp of a major change. We're creating jobs again. American manufacturers are booming again. Where's the Britain America can't lead the world in manufacturing? We're lowering the deficit. Towns that had been forgotten and left behind are coming alive again, bringing back a sense of pride. All those chip factors, uh, fabs I talked about, they're going to be all over America. They're not just going to be in the Northeast and the West Coast. They're all through the Central America. You know people who come from the people like, for example, up in Scranton where I came from, where I was born and raised, or other states across the country, where all of a sudden the factory that employed six, eight, six seven hundred people for years shut down and went abroad. Not only did they lose the jobs, they lost their sense of pride. They lost their sense of belonging. How many folks do you have know folks in the Midwest who had their kids come up and say, Mom, Dad, I got a good education, but I got to leave. There's no jobs here. No reason to stay. We're bringing jobs back all across America. This is no time to put all this at risk, to threaten a recession, to put at risk millions of jobs, to undermine America's standing in the world. Republican threats are dangerous and they make no sense. Folks, we have to keep going and finish the job. I've long said it's never, ever, ever been a good bet to bet against America. Never. And I can honestly say, as I stand here today, I've never been more optimistic about America's future than I am this very day. We just have to remember who in God's name we are. We're the United States of America. There is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we work together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got to fight. We're going to win this fight. Thank you.